one over here? Okay. There we go. We know how to advance the slides now. That's good. Um, so I'm Denise Quirk. I have a master's in uh, marriage and family therapy, which I obtained from the University of Nevada, Reno in 1992. So I've been out practicing solidly since then for 23 years. And my initials after my, my, my name are MFT, Marriage and Family Therapist, LCABC, I'm a Nevada Licensed Clinical Alcohol and Drug Counselor, BACCNCGC2 is my national certification as a gambler and gambling supervisor, gambling counselor and supervisor, and CPGCS is my Nevada certification as a certified problem gambling counselor supervisor. Uh, my current title is CEO and Clinical Director of the Reno Problem Gambling Center, or RPGC. That is the nonprofit portion of my work where we do outpatient treatment only for gamblers and family members. And then the reason I say only is because you'll hear about other agencies that do other kinds of addiction treatment, and in the RPGC we only treat gambling. I am the owner of Red Hawk Counseling, my private for-profit outpatient treatment, um, which I do out of my office in Reno and in Lovelock, and that includes DUI, anger management, parenting, marriage and family issues, and other individual um, counseling appointments, and I'm still taking new clients. And in the last six years, I also obtained um, a special franchise and training to do sex and pornography addiction treatment mainly for couples, and the name of that specific curriculum is LifeStar. So those of you that are familiar with LifeStar Network online, you can read more about it or certainly ask me if you'd like to uh, refer anybody to that practice that I do here. And I'm currently an instructor online at UNR, uh, developed an, a gambling course called Exploring Gambling Behaviors which is under the addictions umbrella which Cassatt very generously helped fund me uh, creating that class in 2005, and now it's online every semester. So that's what I have to tell you about me, and now over to Denise Everett. Well, I obviously don't have quite as many initials behind my name as Denise Quirk does, but um, I too have been in the field for um, many over 20 years. I, my master's is in counseling and educational psychology from UNR. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Nevada, a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. I'm currently the executive director of Quest Counseling and Consulting here in Reno, which is a nonprofit agency that provides outpatient services for primarily adolescents with drug and alcohol and or mental health issues, but we also work with couples, families, um, and individuals and adults. And so, um, but our, our focus is really on adolescents and young adults, which I guess the nomenclature these days is emerging adults on um, ages 18 to 26. I also am a part-time instructor at UNR for CASAT. I most recently worked with the uh, group of peer support specialists, which was really fun to do. And um, in the past, I started out in the field at NASAC Northern Area Substance Abuse Council, which actually morphed into Bristlecone Family Services. And I worked with um, Adolescent Care and Treatment, which turned into Stage Wind, which is no longer in existence. And I've been at, at Quest for the last eight years. I'm not sure if I said that. So at any rate, um, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. So we want to know if you guys can hear us all right, and if there's any difficulty with the technology, please send um, a little text message in the chat room and let us know if there's anything we can do to make this experience better for you. So if you have any difficulties with the hearing, with the visual, is there anything that we can help you with, send us a message. Um, we have goals and objectives to accomplish today, not the least of which are the general ones that we are mentioning on this slide, we hope to share with you some of our knowledge and experience and help you absorb and listen and be able to interact with us about that information, which as you see on the little funnel on the left, we hope will lead to discovery and application. We want this to be useful for you and we appreciate all feedback on how to make it useful. The topics are youth and alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs and gambling. 
um, what kind of services are available in our northern Nevada area for these issues, and what kind of data and prevention information we can offer to you about them. Uh, much as we would like to give you a full course on this, we've shrunk it down to two hours. And trust me, we have so much information. We could go on and on. So if there's any particular topic that you want to hear a little bit more about either today or in the future, give us feedback on that as well. So we're going to start with, um, with mental disorder defined by DSM-5. You will probably notice, those of you that may already be using DSM-5, that there's been a transition toward um, the word disorder in describing alcohol use, substance use, and gambling. And you're going to hear that much more frequently than you're going to hear the term dependence or addiction. Even though we still use those words all day long with our clients, with the different agencies that we deal with, the term disorder is the one that you're going to see um, generically across the board describing mental illness and substance use disorders and gambling disorders, you're going to hear the word disorder. So I want to heighten that by pointing out that the DSM-5 definition of a disorder uses words like syndrome and clinically significant. And over and over again, I saw the phrase clinically significant impairment or distress describing DSM-5 disorders. And I have shrunk that to CSID. And in a presentation, several presentations that I've done lately, I've got a little black baseball cap with the letters CSID um, in bold letters that makes it look like I'm some kind of a special CSI person. My colleagues and I use that hat to point out that when, when any of us are wearing the hat of diagnosing and assessing people, we're looking for clinically significant impairment or distress. And I promise you that you two, as um, professionals in the field, are going to encounter things that aren't in the DSM-5 yet or that just can't be described on a certain page in the DSM. You have the option to put all of the diagnostic criteria in a tidy list and call it what you will and justify it by saying this person has clinically significant impairment or distress because of their fill-in-the-blank behavior mood disturbance, et cetera, and you will be honored by insurance companies and hospitals and other treatment providers because you're using the right terminology, clinically significant impairment or distress. There's a, um, this is Denise, and I just wanted to do a little bit of a general overview about um, addressing gambling, and this is from, from the Center for Addiction and I'm clicking back to the other slide because I just remembered. I'm going to interrupt you, Denise. We're going to have our first polling question now. Oh, yes. <laughs> I should have put a little uh, flag on that. Yes. So forgive me for interrupting you in mid-stride there. Um, we've got a polling question for you to answer. And the question is, what part of the world has the highest rate of gambling? And if you could please select one. I would greatly appreciate it. So I want clarification, Denise E. This is Denise Q. Um, when you say gambling, do you mean gambling overall or gambling problem? Well, the, according to um, the article, the population prevalence of problem gambling, we're focusing, we're on, focusing on problem gambling. Thank so, you. so this isn't just recreational, social, different types of gambling. We're talking problem gambling here. And so as you pick your answer, what part of the world do you think has the highest rate of a gambling problem? We would like to hear from you. OK, so it looks like everyone has responded. And we've got um, seven people all together that answered. And we have put the results up in front of you. How interesting are these results, Denise? Well, I, I, it's, it's fascinating that there's a tie between Asia and North America. So. Um, the answer, according to this research article that was published in 2012, um, it's actually from the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. It is, um, it's Asia. Mm. And um, the lowest rates are actually found in Europe, intermediate rates in North America and Australia, and the highest rates in Asia. And the countries that really um, came to light in this study are Singapore, Macau, Hong Kong, and South Africa, believe it or not. And um, the highest rates in the US 
as far as the states went were um, Puerto Rico, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Nevada. And one of the interesting things that I discovered in the research is that in the last several years, almost every single state in the United States now has some kind of um, form of legalized gambling except Hawaii and Utah. So those are the only two states that don't have um, any form of legalized gambling. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. It is, and I was just in Seattle last week at the NADAC um, National Conference, and a gal from Hawaii walked up to me, having sat through part of my uh, Gambling 101 lecture, and said, um, I appreciate that you're mentioning that there's no legalized gambling in Hawaii, because I also always mention there's plenty of Hawaiians who gamble. They find ways to do it illegally. And she said, are you aware of how many flights and hotels uh, have a direct attraction from Vegas to Hawaii? And I said, yes. I, I heard that there's casinos that specialize in Hawaiian gamblers that they fly them straight from Honolulu to Vegas. So we had a very interesting conversation about maybe there's not legalized gambling in Hawaii, but they come straight across the ocean to Vegas all the time. So um, yeah, there was a, it's an it, you know it's an interesting perspective on what goes on in the United States, and there's a lot of um, research out there about. I was uh, you know what I was really amazed about when I was looking at the research how much of it is out of Canada, and my understanding is from my reading is that the government um, there actually pays for all of the research the prevention, intervention, and treatment around gambling issues. So they're much more able to gather that data together and um, share it with the populace. And you know, on the internet, obviously, they can share it with the world. And it was just, it was fascinating to read. And they really do seem to have a handle on the various aspects of, of gambling and what provinces have the, the biggest issues and um, information around accessibility and how easy or, or difficult it is to gamble in different areas of Canada. And um, they do include data sometimes about the United States and other areas of the world. And like I said, this particular study did come out of Ontario. So it was really interesting. Thanks, Denise. I tell my students in my um, online class that if you find any research from Canada, it's good. I have yet to find bad research coming out of Canada because of that very thing. They've got ongoing dollars flowing into it about gambling and gambling supporters. So you're going to find very good data coming out of Canada. I'm going to talk for a minute. Um, this is a review for those of you that listened to our first webinar several weeks ago. I think it's very important, and that's why I'm repeating it that there was a prevalence study coming out of Oregon in 2008 that is a repeat of the prevalence study done in 1998, which is always super valuable for those of you that appreciate good stats. When, when you do a good prevalence study, that's one thing. But when you do a second one that completely replicates the first one 10 years ago and you compare them side by side, super valuable gems of knowledge coming out of this prevalence study. And at the end of my uh, portion of talking about this, I'm going to give you the reference so that you can find the whole thing. These are a few highlights out of the executive summary. Um, six in ten Oregon adolescents, 63% of adolescents have gambled at some time in their lives. And if you'll just pause on that number for a minute, adolescents are children between the ages of 12 and 18 whose brains are not formed yet. As I like to say, they're still tofu. There, there is a lot of stuff that is yet to be solidified in their brains. And if 63% of the Oregon adolescents are gambling, whether it's for pleasure or problem, that is a huge impact on their little developing brain. 46% um, have gambled in the past year, and 3% gamble once a week or more often. And that 3% is where the problem and gambling disorder uh, numbers and statistics come out of. That is about consistent across the world with youth gambling numbers. Three to four percent, sometimes more, are definitely identified as being gambling addicted. And usually um, 10, 20 percent of them are at the at-risk or problem area. Denise Everett's going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, 
How huge is that, that how many numbers of our adolescents surveyed in a prevalence study, let alone the ones that haven't been surveyed yet that may not be telling the whole truth, are experiencing trouble in their lives relating to gambling between the ages of 12 and 18. Um, and as you probably already know, because you're in the field, there is not a lot of treatment available for that. Even in Nevada, if I were to have a person who is addicted to gambling between the ages of 12 and 18 walk through my door, I would be sending them to Denise Everett at Quest Counseling. And Denise, last time I checked, you don't have several groups for gamblers, and you don't have 50 or 100 kids walking in the door for that. So you would have to pretty much design a program specifically for that. Exactly, exactly. We would. And we would do that. I mean, you know, we have um, one person on staff who trained with you who is, um, you know, very effective at working with people with gambling issues. And the other really interesting thing about the adolescent statistics, as far as I'm concerned, is that four times as high as the adult population. Yes, it is. And um, which is really scary. There's Probably um, with the research I've read is between 1% and 1.2% of the adult population have, um, are, have gambling disorders. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it, it, which is about 2 million people, which is a lot of people. And then there's another, what, 10 to 15% that have problem behaviors around their gambling. They aren't um, necessarily, could be diagnosed as disordered, but they have problem gambling behaviors. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and with the adolescents, it's four times as high. So it's, it's really interesting. And I, um, I know from everything that I've read that in, because of the prevalence of, of gaming and gambling in recent years, you know, with all of the states, the proliferation of legalized gambling in all of the states, um, internet gambling, you know, the, all the on online activities, it's going to be interesting to see in the future how many of these adolescents carry this behavior into adulthood. Absolutely. So that's a little frightening. Absolutely. Um, and I see there's a question in the, in the chat box about Oregon being uh, having 18 years as the legal age, or is it 21? I believe it's 18. I would have to check with uh, the gambling expert who a lot of research comes from and who has run the Oregon uh, program for gambling treatment, Jeff Murata. He could tell you that in an instant. I could send him an email and get back to you, Miss Allison, before our um, our time with you is up and give you the answer to that. But I believe it's 18. So a couple other things that we've got on this slide just for your interest. Um, most often, the, the youth in Oregon are doing free gambling type games on the internet, which unfortunately, I call that a gateway drug or a gateway addiction experience, should they be doing lots of um, free gambling type things on the internet in your house and you are not looking over the shoulder of the children making sure that they're not ordering extra avatars, extra credits, or extra doodads um, online, then I think you're, you're probably ignorant of how pervasive this is with our youth literally doing things that you would not consider illegal. For example, they can, they can go onto a Facebook site, they can play games, and without being 21, they can purchase credits or avatars or lives or things that will give them advancing into their Facebook playing, which to me is a complete path down toward addiction if they have a problem. So we'll hear a little bit more about that when we're talking about internet gaming. So Denise E. just, just Googled it. You're so good. And it says here that um, the minimum age for those participating in most legal gaming activities is 18 in Oregon. And, um, so, and there's a little bit more about that. We're going to get the next page. I'll just plumb that back up. Closely followed in the Oregon statistics by wagering on card games with friends or family, which is such a typical activity for so many of us growing up. So again, we're, we're talking about gambling participation. We're not talking about gambling problems yet. Just in this prevalence study, they found out what kind of gambling activity they were doing. And the other super popular activity is betting on sports and wagering on private games of personal skill, like pool, basketball games, anything that you can wager on, which if you have a desire to gamble, you'll find something to wager on. So back to the Oregon um, legalized information that we just found on the internet. 
For slot machine gambling, the minimum legal age is 21, and it says even legal gambling activities are highly regulated by um, statute, however, so there's a lot of good law around how to gamble in Oregon. Thanks, Allison, for that question. Um, boys are far more likely to gamble regularly than girls, and older adolescents are more likely to gamble regularly than other adolescents. You'll see that over and over again, that boys have a slightly more significant number of uh, people participating in gambling than girls. It's not a huge, significant number. It's a couple of percent. Um, I just kind of wanted to jump in there on the, the, the second bullet point around mm -hmm. sports. Oh, um, sure. One yeah. of the things that I read, too, um, is that adolescents who are involved in sports gamble at twice the rate at adolescents who are not athletes, that which was really fascinating to me. Juicy tidbit. Yes. If they're involved in sports, they're more likely to gamble. Exactly. I'm exactly. sure that's with adults as well. Well, and it's not you know that it's bad or wrong. We're not moralizing here, but I just think it's something interesting to make sure that people have on their radar yes. that they can pay attention to, especially with their kids and their clients. Be aware. There you go. Um, and I just have another question that popped up in the chat room. Can I phrase that cl clinically significant disturbance in context? Sure. Clinically significant impairment or distress, CSID. In context, what I'm asking you all to be alert when you're doing assessments and evaluations as you're diagnosing people, I would like you to be more heightened and more aware of money and financial and, and depression and debt issues that your clients are presenting with that may already be addicted to something else or may have some other presentation, that's how you're going to find the gambling disorder, number one, is usually if they have a financial problem, they have a uh, relationship problem, they have a debt problem, they have a, in, in our youth, it's usually some kind of a friends have changed or their school performance has changed. And um, where I want you to use clinically significant impairment or distress in your evaluations is when they may have an additional behavioral component or an additional process addiction looking like thing that is not already numerically outlined in the DSM-5. For example, internet addiction is, didn't make the cut in DSM-5, but we all know plenty of people that have every sign and symptom of being addicted to the internet that we see coming through our practices. You can call it, um, I would, um, in my paperwork, I would call it a, um, under substance use or related disorders, I would call it a process addiction, and I would say because of the clinically significant impairment or distress as outlined by or as evidenced by withdrawal, tolerance, blah, 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 all the evidence that you're going to give for um, the clues as to why you would diagnose this, and then you can call it that even though there's nothing in the DSM-5 to support it with a number right now. Well, the other interesting thing about the numbers, as long as we're talking about DSM-5, um, you know, the interesting thing to me that actually you pointed out was that they're, they're no longer using the Roman numeral 5. They're now using their Arabic 5. And um, so, if you have a, see a training and they have DSMV, then you probably don't want to access that particular training because they don't even know the right name for it. And then the reasoning behind them using the Arabic 5, Denise, is? Because when it took 15 to 18 years for them to go from DSM-4 TR to DSM-5, we are hoping and they are planning to do new iterations and new additions to the DSM without having to publish a whole new book. So electronically, they'll be able to do DSM 5.1. Then they'll be able to add something and do DSM 5.2. And it doesn't work very well with Roman numerals. So smartly, they switched to Arabic numerals. So it's DSM the number five, not DSM V moving forward. I've got, I've got a slide up here that just kind of briefly outlines for you the difference between the old multi-axial system and the new non-axial um, system that DSM-5 is using, which we are referring more to dimensions than we are to axes. So we used to talk about the five axes, and um, we had dimension or axis one, axis two, and axis three. Well, all of those axes that we used to talk about can be measured if you jump across um, 
dimensions one, two, three, formerly axes one, two, and three, can be addressed through the cross-cutting symptom measures, and that's a tool that I'm going to show you in a minute that DSM-5 has available to you on the American Psychiatric Association website, the APA website. You can download it for free. You don't have to go buy a DSM-5 right now to get this form, but you can start using it, and it's very user-friendly with your clients or patients. And then, forgive me on the arrow, I'm going to take my little arrow, I'm not sure if you can see it from my screen, but, um, okay, Terry says no, can't see my arrow. Where dimension four is on your left, that's where the line should be going straight across to the ICD-9V codes and the ICD-10, which has not been published yet, but is coming out either later this year, uh, I've heard it's coming out later this year, Z codes. So instead of talking about um, our old um, axis four, talking about the different aspects of the relationship or the marital distress or whatever, the V and Z codes are what we're going to be referring to now with DSM-5. And then finally, the, the um, AXIS-5, which used to be GAF, the Global Assessment of Functioning, is now HUDAF. Um, <laughs> that's what I call it anyway. That's the initials for it. And I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into that uh, moving into the next slide. I just, very quickly, I just want to mention the fact that right now, ICD-9 codes, um, you also have to use the DSM-4 yep. when you use that. With the new ICD-10 codes, my understanding is, is that they will not be using the DSM-5 because they have incorporated all of the information from the DSM-5 into the ICD-10 codes. That's so good. it's not going to be two entirely different um, documents that you have to look at for billing. So I, that, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Yeah, those of you that are doing to the Affordable Care Act. And the I, new ASAM. And the new ASAM criteria. So the good news is, there is still some good news, all right? 312.31 is the diagnostic code in DSM-4 and 5 for um, gambling disorder. The unfortunate news <laughs> is it will be an impulse control disorder in ICD-10, so it's still going to be called pathological gambling, and it's a substance use and addictive disorder in DSM-5. So DSM-5 is kind of launched out there with process and behavioral addictions and calling it the new thing. ICD-10 is calling 312.31 F63.0. It's going to be F63.0 all around the world in all of your billing codes. So those of you that are going to be billing for pathological gambling or gambling disorder, whatever you want to call it, it's F63.0. So that is going to be the same internationally across the board. And if I had my Carnac the Magnificent um, Gypsy hat on and have the envelope tapping my head like Johnny Carson used to do, I am predicting that we are all going to need to do the ICD-10 billing codes, and that will be our primarily focus on numbers. We're still going to have DSM diagnostic codes because that's what we like to do in America, but the rest of the world is usually is using ICD-10. So we'll probably have to learn those. Okay. So this is your quick slide of the difference between what used to happen in DSM-4 and what is happening now with DSM-5 as it relates to gambling disorder. On the top part of the screen, you'll see that there were, look right through the middle at the blue arrow running from left to right. Um, that was the um, continuum of diagnostic questions that you would ask, and if they said yes, to five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten questions, you could somebody as having this problem area, which we used to call kind of the use, abuse, addiction scale of gambling. There was no diagnostic way of putting, according to DSM-4, that the person <coughs> had a gambling problem, even if they answered yes to three or four of the diagnostic questions. That was kind of a sad time for us because we wished that we could put somebody into treatment, but if they didn't have a total of five yeses, they kind of didn't make the cut. So now, in the world of DSM-5, where we are talking about the gambling disorder severity, I'm going to take my little green arrow down here and point out to you that there are now nine criteria 
in DSM-5 for diagnosing somebody with a gambling disorder instead of 10. One of them was removed. It was the one about illegal acts. I hope you are still asking that question, but it's no longer necessary for diagnosis. So now, if somebody answers four or five yeses, you can diagnose them as having gambling disorder mild, which is awesome for the treatment opportunities and the recognition that gambling disorder deserves. If they answer six or seven yeses, you call them gambling disorder moderate. If they answer eight or nine yeses, you call them gambling disorder severe. So if anybody has any questions about that moving forward, about how you write it up, just remember gambling disorder, mild, four or five, moderate, six or seven, severe, eight or nine. I hope that's helpful. I love this little arrow, okay? I have a little green arrow. So this is the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule 2.0. Um, this is what used to be the GAF, and you can have the client fill this out if they are, look, my green arrow is working in, yay. You can have the client fill this out, they're going to circle these right here, if they are able, meaning can they read English and understand, and are they literally physically capable of, of using a pen or a pencil. And you would explain to them that this is health conditions involving diseases or illnesses, and this could be addiction or other kinds of things, because you want to find out how able or how disabled they are so that you can end up with a general disability score, which we used to call the GAF. Now it's the general disability score. After they fill out this entire thing, or you help them fill it out, you're going to do the math, which is simple, even though it looks complicated here. I promise you it's simple. By counting up the, the measurement, like if they, if they said miles, you give them a two, and that's the highest score right there is a two. And then you do the math, and you're going to come up with a score that tells how able or disabled this person, and you are so going to want this if you are doing residential assessment or you're trying to help a person leave jail and go to the proper level of care. You do not want to send someone to outpatient care if they're getting really high disability scores because they are not able to participate in society, they have work and school problems, they have household functioning problems. This is about activities of daily living. You are basically doing a very brief occupational assessment right here with the person that's going to give you a score that's going to help them get into the proper level of care. And if you have any more questions about that, love to tell you more. I hope you're using it. This is one of the things that you can get from the um, American. American Psychiatric Association, the APA site. And then the other thing that we referred to a minute ago that is now DSM-5 popular is the um, cross-cutting symptom measures. And my little arrow doesn't want to move again. Let's try this one more time. Cross-cutting, I'm not doing it right. Pardon? Yeah, she needs to show me how to use my own mouse. I am, I am sometimes capable. Oh, you just click on the document. Thank you. All right. So, C C S M cross-cutting symptom measures. Look over here on the right-hand corner. Um, wouldn't you like to have something that you could do with your clients when you're doing assessment and evaluation anytime in your clinical experience with them that will give you a quick view of all 13 of these domains? Depression, anger, mania, anxiety, et cetera. Wouldn't you like to have something quick on this and not have to have a PhD or an MD after your name? I do, so I ask the questions or I have them fill in. Um, if they have had little interest or pleasure in doing things, light would be a one, mild would be a two, moderate would be a three, severe would be a four. If you've got a four in any of these 13 domains, it's going to recommend that you go to another quick assessment tool, which they, again, provide for you free on the APA site. And you're going to be able to quickly, whether or not you have the credentials after your name, because they just did a self-report, you're going to be able to quickly recommend more care in the depression area or the anger area. If you do have the credentials and the initials after your name, awesome. You're going to take this CCSM Level 2 assessment with them, and you're going to narrow down what they need. The ones that we are most familiar with is Section 13, Substance Use. It asks questions about drinking, about smoking, about many different kinds of drugs. It does not ask questions about gambling. We still have to ask them the diagnostic questions ourselves. 
We've got a couple screening tools that we'll mention to you that will help with this. Please become more familiar with the CCSM because you're going to want this information from your client. And I think we are getting close to our next survey. I think it's going to be after this slide to queue up Ms. Sherry. Um, this is the last couple of slides that I have for you on the Oregon statistics are how high the prevalence rates are among adolescents living in households without a parent compared to those with one or two parents present. I think that's a big duh for most of us and how much we honor single parenthood because it's so much harder for them to accomplish parenting by themselves. We just want you to know that, yes, it's true. Single parents have a harder time keeping an eye on or whatever the other factors are involved in adolescents who end up um, choosing behaviors like gambling. The high prevalence rates are among adolescents who have ever gambled on card games. Are more likely to be male and live in households with incomes below the median. So we need to pay attention to low income as a factor when we are asking questions about their gambling. They are more likely to be um, as Denise Everett mentioned earlier, playing sports. And that could be boys or girls. There's just something about the culture of playing sports that is right for betting. And the activity that they are most likely to have done in the past year, as you see in red, is wager on sports. Um, they usually have lost more than $50 in a single month if they have a problem with gambling. I don't know too many adolescents that walk around with $50 in their pocket in a month. So where they're getting that money from and whether mom and dad are keeping track of the income and outgo of their money is very important. Denise and I were talking yesterday about um, how we helped our children manage their money and how we kept track of it. And there's a reason for that. And what was one of them that you mentioned? I can say it. Oh, yeah. When my daughter got an allowance or um, birthing money, those kinds of things. She had to put a certain percentage into a savings account. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about prevention. OK, good. So moving right along, um, the final uh, slide that I have for you, which I wanted you all to pay attention to if you want to read the research, because there is your reference at the bottom of the page. We are sad to report that relatively high proportions of parents, whether or not they gamble, believe that gambling is a harmless activity that youth who gamble are unlikely to have problems in school, and that youth gambling is not associated with alcohol or drug use, which is a big lie. Sadly, parents are uninformed, and I think it becomes our duty to inform. So we are going to launch into more information about why adolescents gamble, and I'd like to pull up our next polling question so that you can be looking at what is about to pop up. And it has to do with medication. So what disease or diseases suggest that a medication that may actually increase the likelihood of gambling and other behavioral problems is happening? In other words, if your doctor is treating you for this disease, what medicine might he give you that will increase your likelihood of gambling and other behavioral problems? So I'm looking for, um, looking for the diseases that you think will have medicine that could inadvertently increase your gambling and other behavioral. And this is uh, something that the research will bear out that you might be surprised if you haven't already seen the commercial for this particular medication, where it says, warning, if you take this medicine, you may have an increase in gambling, in uh, sexual behavior, an increase in risky behavior. So if you can imagine, as we're going to give you the answers here shortly, there are a lot of older people who present with either restless leg syndrome or Parkinson's. So the people who answered Parkinson's, you got it. Mm. Parkinson's and restless leg syndrome are often treated with um, ah. dopaminergic, dopaminergic uh, yeah. medicines like Mirapax which will actually increase the likelihood of you gambling or having other behavioral problems. And what is it called? Era. So people who are taking that medicine, 
I'm hoping are asking their doctor to help them switch to another medicine. And I'm hearing a little bit of feedback, and I'm wondering if we need to, um, do we need to ask anybody to mute their phones? Or do you think that's already been done? OK, good. We'll just keep on moving. Thank you for that. And Denise, over to you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why and they oftentimes um, you know, gamble for the same reasons that adults gamble. And you know, for the entertainment, they start using with friends, those kinds of things. Gambling also activates the same neural reward pathways affected by cocaine and amphetamines. Um, even so, many adolescents view gambling as less harmful than drugs and consider it a rite of passage. So um, we have the syndrome of, well, it's only beer, boys will be boys, those kinds of things. And oftentimes, kids think of gambling as just you know, an, another rite of passage. 90% of kids report having gambled for money. 75% have gambled at home for money. And then 85% of parents do not object to gambling behaviors, teens say. And an interesting statistic that I ran across is that one study found that although 86% of parents surveyed believe that the availability of gambling should be reduced for adolescents, 84% of parents reported that they would buy lottery tickets for their children. So it's like the lottery doesn't count as gambling, which doesn't um, make a lot of sense when you really think about it. And then um, adolescents gamble to win money for excitement and entertainment, social acceptance as a coping mecha mechanism, or to feel a rush. And then for approximately 85% of adolescents, gambling becomes um, no more than a social activity. But for others, it can definitely become problematic or even pathological. And you know, approximately 4 to 8% of adolescents meet the criteria for disordered gambling and compared to 1% of adults. So it's just really um, fascinating about how more often um, adolescents you know, pop up in the surveys of um, having issues around gambling. We also have um, um, adolescent pathological gamblers like adults um, you know, continue to gamble despite negative consequences, continue to chase their losses have preoccupation, inability, um, impaired inability to stop. And many of those factors are similar to what you will find with somebody with a substance use disorder. You know, they have the increased tolerance, um, you know, the preoccupation, spending more time and money, um, you know, seeking their substance or their behavior in the, in the case of gambling. And then prevalence rates for pathological gambling amongst adolescents was higher than reported for adults, as we've mentioned. And then there's some very high statistics around you know, the chasing the losses, escaping problems, using lunch money or allowance. Um, and then the very last one, becoming tense and restless when trying to cut down on their gambling, which is very similar to um, withdrawal when you're talking about substance use disorders. So you have to look at all of those factors. And they all are um, markers that parents and clinicians can look for when they're talking to their adolescent children or clients about their gambling behaviors. Um, also, on the, um, uh, the idea behind gambling is um, having a higher rate of suicide ideation and suicide attempts it seems as though, from the literature, that, um, that that's one of the differences that we see between people with substance use disorders and folks that have, um, have gambling problems. And some of the, the uh, there's a lot of similarities between the addictions, but some of the differences, besides the suicide ideation and suicide attempts, you, do, you know, with gamblers, um, they oftentimes become suicidal. Alcoholics or drug addicts become helpless and hopeless, but they don't necessarily turn to suicide. Gamblers um, also, are, they look, they're fully functioning until they hit bottom. And with people that are using drugs and alcohol, you can usually watch the trajectory, you know, the, the slide from their first use into um, not being able to function anymore. With gamblers, they look good clear up until the end. Um, you can't measure gambling through blood, urine, or hair. 
And gambling, as we listen to, you know, is sponsored, oftentimes sponsored by religion and government. I don't know about you guys, but I've played bingo at church, and, you know, all but two states have legalized gambling. And um, so it's, it, there's like the good housekeeping seal of approval on gambling where there isn't on illicit drugs and those kinds of things. There's no saturation point for gamblers. We were talking about the fact that you cannot possibly drink $50,000 worth of Jack Daniels, but you can easily gamble away 50 grand in one evening, in one sitting. And there's a huge difference. There's just no saturation for a gambler, they, as long as they can stay awake. Gambling recovery which leads into gambling recovery often requires significant financial restitution. And um, when you have somebody who has a drug or alcohol problem, they may come to you broke when they uh, decide to get help or somebody has decided for them that they need help. But generally, gamblers um, are in a position where they owe an enormous amount of money or if they really run through all of their personal assets, their family assets, sometimes their business assets, they may have embezzled. There's a lot of issues around financial restitution. Gamblers don't have like physical hangovers. You know, somebody that does um, substances, does drugs or alcohol will have a, a physical repercussion. Gamblers might have emotional hangovers, but they don't have um, hangovers from a substance. There's no preventative medication for gambling. Um, you know, you can take um, certain medications with drugs and alcohol, and I'm thinking of naltrexone for opiate use and antabuse for alcohol use. And so there's some preventative medications that you can take with drugs and alcohol, and there's nothing for gamblers. And then um, gambling is often overlooked by professionals until the very late stages, simply because I think very oftentimes we don't ask the questions. And one of the things that has really come home to me, because I am not um, a gambling expert, is that we really, in the substance use disorder field, need to be asking more questions of our clients around their gambling behavior. And um, I really do want to, there's a screening tool that we'll talk about in a little bit that I want to put in, onto our evaluation paperwork as a standard um, protocol that, that we engage in from here on out with all of our clients, adolescents and adults. Thank you, Denise, for that, because the Quest counseling I consider to be premier treatment, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear you say that you, too, want to improve your screening and assessment, so I can imagine how many other agencies need to really step up. Um, one of the last things I did want to mention is um, the third bullet point, personality traits reveal adolescent pathological gamblers are more excitable, extroverted, anxious, tend to have difficulty conforming in societal norms and experience difficulties with self-discipline. From the research that I've read, that's mostly for boys. They tend to externalize their, their feelings and conditions. Girls, on the other hand, tend to internalize and have more problems around depression and dysthymia and those kinds of things. And then the very last bullet point, um, kids often have a positive attitude towards gambling and fail to completely understand the risks or the odds associated with gambling. And it was really interesting because a lot of um, what I read was that gamblers are fantasy thinkers. They are incredibly superstitious. And um, that superstition leads to the illusion of control. And they have absolutely no control over you know, the games that they're playing, quote unquote, and, you know, some examples of that are charms like rabbit's feet, um, clothing. I read about one person in a poker tournament in Las Vegas who wore the, the same shirt and hat for seven days in a row. Can't imagine what the guy smelled like by then. Um, numbers, like in the United States, in the West, 13 is an unlucky number. Um, four is an unlucky number for Asians. Lady luck, having a woman, a beautiful woman, blow on your dice before you throw them. And then rituals before and, and during gambling, like how many times, you know, um, you tap things. Um, you know, I, I don't know. My grandmother used to wear white gloves when she gambled on the slot machines in Las Vegas. I mean, just very kind of strange things, but it's very fantasy thinking. And so that's one of the reasons when we talk about treatment that, 
you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is often used. So anyway, I, th this information actually came from a great journal, which is online, which is gambling, the Electronic Journal of, of Gambling. And it was an a issue that's a few years old, but I thought that, you know, most of this information was um, very salient compared to, you know, a lot of the information, that, the research that, I, that I've been reading about um, adolescent gamblers. So, Thanks for that, Denise. And I'm going to say pull up polling question number three now, Sherry. And while she's doing that, I want to um, reinforce something that Denise found in her reading, that the youth females and the youth males are looking a lot like the adult females and the adult males that I work with, whereas females have a tendency toward emotional reasons for why they started gambling or why they're trying to escape their emotional distress. And males have a greater tendency to seek action and to seek competitive risky behaviors, and they tend to be more action gamblers, more uh, doing the kinds of gambling that require a little bit of skill. So I told her yesterday when we were discussing this, interesting to me that um, there are very similar behaviors starting out very young in females and males that we end up seeing in their older years. So um, when we look at the warning signs and behavioral changes that you ask parents about when diagnosing addiction, um, I appreciate that 100% of you picked um, the fourth one, all the above. And I would also add, if there's anything else that you want to put in the chat room, I was kind of hoping that you would throw out what are, what are the signs slash behaviors slash changes that you start thinking, ooh, I need to start screening for a gambling problem based on what you've just heard today and what your experience is. If you would throw a little bit of that into the chat room, I think it would be beneficial for the rest of us to hear what you guys are looking for. Thanks. But just a few more statistics that we've already covered, so I don't think there's any reason to go into too much depth there. Okay. Um, I did want to address gamers also, um, because when I polled the clients that we work with, the adolescent clients that we work with at Quest, um, we actually have many more gamers, video gamers, than we do gamblers, as far as I can ascertain. And what I found fascinating was gamers average age is 34, although um, the average number of years that they've been playing is around 12 and that the number of households in the U.S. that play video games is 67%. I would have thought it might be higher, but I would assume that it's probably families that, you know, have children in them. And then 25% um, of gamers are under 18, 49%, that's almost half, are between the ages of 18 and 49, and then the rest are over 50. And then in 2010, the average gamer spent about eight hours a week playing video games, and I have a, um, a specific case study I'm going to talk about, and the person that I talk to spends about eight hours a day playing video games. And once again, you know, about 60% are male and 40% are female, so there's more males um, indulging in, in video games than there are in, um, than the females, so. Thanks for all your answers that you guys are sending in the chat room. There's some really good stuff in there. Selling prize belongings, preoccupation with their phone or sports games. Um, I totally agree that when, when you have any youth that is obsessed with anything of value, either getting it, selling it, doing it, you've got a warning sign. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, He also said video games um, provide a much more manageable environment and have built-in structure, giving the player a circumscribed environment with clear, consistent rules. And the opposite happens in real life, which can be very chaotic, confusing, distracting. So um, oftentimes folks with ADHD like the video games because it's a really um, a very focused, controlled environment. So, um, gaming also releases dopamine similar to what's observed after intravenous injection of stimulant uh, drugs. So the gaming and the gambling, when they do the brain scans, um, have their brains react very similarly to folks that are doing drugs. 
and then games that are strongly associated with problem video plays uh, playing are games that involve identifi identification with a, a spe very specific fictional character. The, the fictional character discussion that we had yesterday that you guys will see in, a, in another uh, in, would you like me to go back to the previous slide? I'm sure. Okay. Um, we had an interesting conversation yesterday about um, what you did with your comics. So I'm going to ask Sherry to zip ahead to polling question number five, because when you guys see what the youth today are doing with ours and how they're involved in their games, um, you know what? It was actually question four. So I apologize, you guys. I thought I was more prepared than that. It's question number four on the polling. Let's, let's think, harken back to when you were a certain hero that you like to read about and follow. Um, old timers like us liked reading Superman comics for a fantasy or an empowerment boost. Uh, what are you noticing about the differences between what we used to read and what current teens who play video games um, are experiencing with their personal avatars? And while people are filling that um, out, Denise, if you want to kind of expand on I, I'm curious what you're observing with the kids who are video gamers. Um, what is it that they're going after? What What is exciting, thrilling, and what are they trying to get a boost from? From my conversations that I've had with the kids that are heavy gamers, my understanding is, is that they often feel um, disenfranchised, unpopular, um, you know, kids in that adolescent developmental stage oftentimes have low self-esteem. Many of these kids have been bullied, like we had been talking about. There's a high correlation of um, you know, gamers that have additional mental health problems, so they're not as accepted by their peers, perhaps. So when they've got an avatar in an online game, that can be their alter ego. They've got somebody that is um, strong and capable and competent and a leader and very specifically um, theirs, belongs to them. And in the old days when you and I used to like read comic books and you know have you know a, you know our favorite characters on TV programs or you know movies, those kinds of things, we had no control over what those folks did. So we could admire them from afar, but we didn't necessarily um, identify them as being us. Mm -hmm. The kids today with their avatars, that's them. That's who they want to be. That's who they wish they could be. That's what they want to project to the world but don't. So there's a huge difference between the ability um, of us you know, to read about something and then for these kids to actually be able to manipulate their world. That's good. It's the manipulation factor. Thank you for highlighting that. And your answers are great. They, they are having more sexualized. Um, we did not know that Superman was going to bed with anyone, but all of, the, all of the games that I've seen the teens playing involve a lot of sexualization. And um, you guys had some great answers in there. Thank you for that. Again, um, you know, we, I want to talk a little bit about prevention, and I found this information from the North American Training Institute, which is actually in Minnesota, and it looked really interesting. I haven't actually used any of this the, the, this information, but it, it looked really good. The um, Want to Bet an Educator's Guide in Curriculum, um, it's designed and field tested, it's an interdisciplinary curriculum to discourage underage gambling. And didn't you, um, you have some information about I a treatment do. center here in northern Nevada that uses that, right? I do. I know that at least one person who is on our um, webinar with us today um, is out in the Fallon area and New Frontier Treatment Center was very gracious and benevolent in choosing the NATI, um, North American Training Institute training curriculum which produced 30 hours of training for interns who wanted to become uh, certified problem gambling counselors at New Frontier and they provided those 30 hours which was a very expensive, you know, practically a full semester's worth of training for these 
um, drug and alcohol counselors who wanted to become certified problem gambling counselor interns. So um, if the person who is out there, or if there's more than one at New Frontier listening to us today, wants to chime in on the chat about what they thought about the NATI training, love to hear your opinion on that, because I remember my interns over the years saying that it was, it was tough, but it was useful. And so for those of you who are thinking about going down the path of becoming certified as a problem gambling counselor intern in the state of Nevada, you need to know that you need 30 hours of documented CEUs uh, live and or um, online. And this is one way of getting them, is you could literally take the NATI curriculum and get all 30 of those hours prior to becoming an intern. And if you'd like more information about becoming a certified problem gambling counselor intern, because I am a supervisor in the state of Nevada, I'd be more than happy to share my experience with you. And there are other people on the line here um, on our webinar that would probably gladly tell you what their experience is. So be sure and include that in your chat if you'd like. Um, the other piece is the, my parent has a gambling problem, hey, what about me? And it's a comprehensive guide for, and it targets counselors, teachers, school administrators, et cetera, um, you know, children serving organizations. And it's five workbooks and, an, you know, an educational DVD, interactive CD, those kinds of things. It does cost. I think it was about $200, as I recall. And then there's this really interesting magazine called Wanna Bet Magazine, and it's for kids, and it's online. So you can look for all of those materials through the North American Training Institute, but I found that to be um, a really interesting research source. So um, the other thing I, I want to talk about prevention is that just like when you're talking about substance use disorders, when you're talking about process addictions, no one prevention program will work for everybody. And then, um, you know, prevention programs need to be geared to the youth's developmental level. So you aren't going to be wanting to, to give a prevention message to a 13-year-old that you would give to a, an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. And that, like, abstinence-only messages are generally much better for younger youth. They're more likely to listen. And the idea behind that is the longer that you can delay the onset of gambling behavior or any other negative risk taking behavior, the better off you are. Because the older they are, the less likely they are to actually develop an addiction issue. Because of that tofu, squishy brain that they have that's not solidified yet. Exactly, exactly. So um, the idea being, you know, what the research says is that when you're an adolescent and you're indulging in certain behaviors, those are the behaviors that are going to stick with you. Because your brain is actually pruning areas that it doesn't use. So if you're not um, doing positive pro-social activities and you're doing things like gaming, gambling, drinking, drugging, those kinds of, those are the things that are going to stick with you and make it more difficult to undo as you grow older because you're actually creating pathways in your brain around those activities. So one of the things that we do at Quest is we really try to encourage pro-social activities with our adolescents. So if there are activities that they used to do that they no longer do, we try to get them re-involved. Or if they never had any kind of sports activity or hobbies or anything like that, we try to find something that will be um, you know, positive that they might become interested in that we can encourage them to do. And I can, you know, we've had quite a few, um, oh my gosh, taggers, graffiti artists mm. um, come across our, our doorstep. And so rather than them defacing public property and destroying other people's um, you know, walls and fences and things like that, we actually have tried to get them into programs in the community where they can use their art in a much more positive way. We got a, a mm. scholarship for you know, one young man to take a class at the Nevada Museum of Art. Oh. You know, we've gotten some of them hooked up with VSA. You know, we're trying to make sure that if that's their passion and their interest, they have some kind of outlet and can do a pro-social activity. We also do um, parties. Like with our adults, we, every eight weeks I have a party. And in the summertime we do a barbecue. Um, like our next party is going to be on the 30th. Uh, Thursday night, and so we're going to have a Halloween theme. I told my adults to come in costume if they want to. 
you know, we'll have finger foods and soda pop, and I bought a CD with spooky music on it. And what I like to talk to them about is their um, the most memorable Halloweens they had in their past from their childhood, whether it be you know positive or negative. What was their more, most memorable Halloweens? And with the kids, we often do you know contingency management kind of activities if. The group has gone well for a week. We'll have a pizza party. Mm -hmm. If um, you know, we we especially at Quest House with the boys. You know, we run a transitional living home for adolescent boys, 13 to 17, and we bend over backwards looking for activities that they might be interested in, that they can participate in, that they would not perhaps normally have an opportunity to do. So we've taken them to the museum. And they participated in the Recovery Month Walkathon, Recovery Month Recovery Picnic. We get tickets to Aces games, to basketball games. All you know, we try to in, in, interest them in as many different things as possible. And um, and I think you and I were talking about our own personal. We were yesterday. Uh, the conversation started wrapping around what we learned and enjoyed doing as teenagers. And without full disclosure, but partial disclosure, I would say that I taught myself how to knit when I was 14. I was the oldest and um, often found myself playing alone at home. And where that meant something to me as an accomplishment and as a joy and as a hobby, moving literally straight through college, being able to do a little knitting and find that to be relaxing and fun for me, it dawned on me when we were discussing the brain and how it solidifies. It kept knitting in my brain because I picked it up again uh, in the last couple decades, and I love to knit. And those of you who know me know this very well. And I thought, well, hooray. I did something that was fun for me as a teenager. It's still fun. And when Denise and I were talking about the pro-social aspect of recovery for individuals who pick up stuff from their childhood or their youth that was good and rekindle it. We both talked about reading and how essential that was moving forward in our lives. What I'm finding fascinating listening to you today, Denise, is the um, infusion that you've got of pro-social activities for both your adolescents and your youth, or excuse me, and your adults in recovery because they, for a variety of reasons, they don't always communicate that that's something that they would like to try. They feel peer pressure, positive or negative, and maybe only the nerds went to the library or the museum when they were growing up. Or maybe the adults have never thought to ask, well, can we have a conversation about what our favorite Halloween was, because that would be useful. They don't think to do that. It's our job as counselors to give them experiential, positive, pro-social events in a safe place like a therapeutic room so that they can take that with them out into the world in recovery. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, parents' role in prevention. We talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, the very first thing I think that's really important is the parents need to know their own beliefs about gambling. And I think that goes for counselors, too. You know, um, we're not immune. I mean, you know, counselors have impairments. And, you know, what, what, is our count, what does our gambling behavior look like? What does our drinking and drugging behavior look like? You know, so we have to pay attention to that. And um, talking to your kids. Um, part of talking, the opposite of talking, the flip side is listening. So we need to make sure that when we're chatting with our kids about you know, gambling behaviors and those kinds of things, that we also listen to them. And something that I found really interesting is that kids think of betting as, if they use the term betting, it's not nearly as negative as the word gambling. It's not as laden with um, negative connotations. And so, you know, talking to them about the fact that betting and gambling are the exact same thing. You also want to be careful about when you're talking to them um, about gambling, how excited do you get when you're talking about it, making sure that you let them know that gambling is a form of entertainment. It's not a way to make money. Um, because I, I've been guilty of saying, thing, oh, if I won the lottery, I'd do this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, well, you know, the odds of me winning the lottery, I'm much more likely to get struck by lightning than I am to win the lottery. <laughs> uh, not to mention the fact that I don't actually buy lottery tickets, so I think it's hard to win the lottery when you don't actually purchase <laughs> the ticket. So 
Um, but listen what, to your, what your kids have to say about gambling. Sometimes that is just the most, you know, you get the most information that way. And um, I have a quick comment on sure. that. Um, if you are encountering parents or children, let's say you have a child in front of you that is worried about their parents, or a parent in front of you that's worried about some other family member, the quickest resource, if, if you don't have the internet right in front of you, because you could certainly find 100 resources on the internet, starting with Gamblers Anonymous and Gammonon, but the quickest resource I have found in my community is every gaming establishment has to have that brochure when the fun stops. It's a trifold brochure with the sunset on it, and it has to be in every gaming establishment, so you walk by them all the time. Grab a couple of those, stick them in your purse or your car, and hand it to the person and say, open this up, and in the middle is the red section that has the warning signs about problem gambling. Those warning signs work for everybody, kids, adults, etc. And I have noticed in counseling with people that are concerned about their loved one, old or young, that just pointing out a few warning signs, what, you mean lying about it is a warning sign? Oh yeah, it's a big warning sign. And there's research to back that up. You have just become somewhat of an expert in gambling warning signs by handing them that brochure. It's very useful. Awesome, wonderful. Yes, the whole talking thing, you know, the whole communication thing. Um, you know, modeling the behavior you want to see. So if you're at home, um, you know, with a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other in front of your computer playing poker and telling your kid not to drink, smoke, or gamble, um, kids do what you do, not what you say. And parents are still the biggest influence on their children's behavior above peers, coaches, friends, everybody. Parents still really heavily influence um, what their children do. Know who your kids' friends are and know who their kids, your kids' friends' parents are. Know where they are, what they're doing. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, your kids are, um, you know, if they're hanging out with friends that are taking really um, high risk with their behavior, whatever that might look like, you, it, I, it would help you to know about it and even to give your child information, additional information about it. So um, know what your kid's doing with their money. We talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, if, if there's nothing to show for it, like, my, you know, my daughter used to take her allowance and go buy, I don't know, candy and comic books, let's say. <laughs> At least I could see where it was. If you're child takes their allowance and you never see anything for it, you know, find out are they going to the movies or are they gambling with their friends kind of thing. So you just you want to pay attention to what they're doing with their money. Educate yourself about gambling. There's a ton of information out there and there's some really good sites that we have cited on our PowerPoint presentation that you can go explore and educate yourself about gambling. Um, know the warning signs, Denise just talked about that, and if you personally have a gambling problem, you might want to seek help. And if your child sees you having an issue, but you're taking the ...include the free resource of Gamblers Anonymous and Gammonon, both online and in person. If you've got a teen with a gambling problem that you would like to send to a support meeting, or if you've got a teen with parents with gambling problems that you would like to send to a support meeting, ideally Gamma Teen would be for you. Sadly, there's no Gamma Teen in our area. I just spoke with a couple of people who attend GA regularly yesterday, and they told me that they would welcome parents and individuals that felt comfortable enough to go to a GA meeting and sit down and talk with the recovering gamblers. So would Gammonon. And I personally would send the family to Gammonon, and I would send the parent who is willing to take the teen to Al-Anon and Alateen. Um, Alateen, in particular, would be a great place for a teenager to sit in a room with other people who have family members who are addicted. And quite frankly, 74% of adult gamblers have had an alcohol problem in the past or the present. So it would be a really appropriate place to go to Al-Anon or Alateen. Awesome. Um, the next couple of slides I just threw in so it would give people a, an idea about the screening questions for problem use gambling. And um, this too, um, it came from 
the North American Training Institute. So the next couple of pages, you know, I just w threw it in there. So if people wanted to use it as a jumping off point with working with youth in their agency or their practice. And um, so it's really, you know, even if they answer yes to even a few of those questions, it might be, you know, an opportunity for you to either de delve, more, you know, deeper into what their behavior looks like or, um, you know, at least ask them more questions, do a more in-depth assessment and evaluation of their gambling behaviors. Um, speaking of which, you know, I found some gambling, I found a minimum of 11 online and all of them actually um, had really good reliability and validity, which was interesting. And then the, um, the lie bet screening instrument um, apparently is very effective and Denise has actually talked to me about it, but it's two questions, it consists of two questions. Have you ever felt the need to bet more and more money is the first question. And then the second question is, have you ever had to lie to people important to you about how much you gamble? So those are the two questions. And those are the questions that I want my agency to start putting onto our evaluation form, so, um, which is I'm gonna, what I'm going to be working on. But it's a screening instrument, so you want to do a more in-depth evaluation if somebody answers yes to either or both of those questions. And you get a 90% reliability that there's a problem if they answer yes to one. So one or both mean, oh my yes, please ask more questions about money, financial problems, gambling, debt, you know, anything related to why are you lying and why would you be increasing your bets. A uh, recent client that I worked with had a less than severe gambling problem, but severe enough that when he was gambling his college money, and because of a language barrier and because of some the way he moved his hands and the video uh, caught him on video at a casino um, moving a bet at the wrong time, he got arrested. He was referred here for an evaluation. He's in his 20s, and this stopped him cold. Basically, where I wanted to go with that was he did not feel that he had that severe of a gambling problem until we sat down and went through all of the screening and assessment questions. Turns out he was relying on gambling and he had started hiding and he had started betting more because he thought he could make enough money to cover some of his college expenses. So he had more of a financial problem at the end of the day, but he had developed a gambling problem around that. It's just, it, you know, it's fascinating, it's, it, which leads me to you know, there's that other comparison between substance use disorders and process disorders around denial. You know, people are in denial about how it's impacting their lives, how it's, you know, adversely affecting what's going on in their lives. So we have to pay attention to that because, you know, if we ask people if they have a gambling problem, if, even if they do, they're going to say no. Yep. You know, it's like most people, you know, do you have an alcohol problem? Nope, I don't. So, um, I can quit any time. Yes, any time I want. So um, there's also the South Oaks Gambling Screen, which is very popular, which a lot of people use. And the SOGS RA is specifically for adolescents. So I wanted to point that out. Many of these things you can just find online. It's, they're really easy to find. So you can just incorporate them into your practice without having to buy anything. And then there's the Center for Addiction and Mental Health um, Gambling Screen. And Center is spelled correctly because it's in Canada. And so um, that's a, a and again, it's a screening tool. So if you they come out positive on the screen, then you want to do a more in-depth evaluation. And then there's the Problem Gambling Severity Index, and then Gamblers Anonymous has their 20 questions around gambling, which is very effective for a lot of folks. And the one, the thing I really like about that is you, it's so easy for someone to do it for themselves. You know, you can ask, you know, if you have a client that you have some suspicion about, you know they might be developing or have um, problem gambling issues, give them the pamphlet. Go get some copies of the Gamblers Anonymous 20 Questions pamphlet and have them um, take the test themselves and see what they have to say. So um, I think it's very valuable to, um, to at least look at some of those screening and assessment tools. Um, I wanted to throw up a couple of um, some risk factors for pathological adolescent gambling, and you know they're very similar once again to substance use disorders. If you're talking about substance as a family history, if you have a family history of gambling, you know just like if you have a family history of um, of drug and alcohol issues, 
there are possible genetic influences, and you have to um, take that into consideration. There's also the psychiatric comorbidity, like if someone has a dual diagnosis. Um, with gambling, it could be substance abuse, you know, mood and anxiety disorders, ADHD, those kinds of things. And then um, personality traits, um, kids with low self-esteem, a high sense of competitiveness, sensitivity to stress or rejection, um, peer influences, immaturity. The other thing I was reading, too, is um, a high intolerance for boredom because gambling is a very, um, you know, it really engages kids and helps them um, not be bored. And I have a, a, a child who's just moving out of adolescence, and the words that I most dreaded coming out of her mouth is, Mom, I'm bored, um, especially when she was a teenager. It was much easier to distract her when she was young, but when she was a teenager and said she was bored, it was like, oh, my gosh, that was really scary. And then there's, you know, social factors. The early exposure to gambling, again, you want to, the longer you can delay um, gambling activity, the less likely you are to have a, um, an addiction problem. And the same thing with substance use disorders. You know, if you start using prior to the age of 15, you're four times as likely to develop an addiction as if you wait until you're older. People that wait until they're 20 um, to do drugs, alcohol, gambling, any of those kinds of activities, generally do not um, develop an addiction. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Their brains may not be completely developed, but I think they're far enough along that you know, they're, they're not um, doing the whole to tofu thing, as, as Denise <laughs> likes to say. The little so. brain is not yet completely solidified. Right. Um, as far as treatment goes, it's kind of a, um, a, a crapshoot around some things. Um, there's not a lot of guidelines out there that I could find for treating um, adolescent pathological gamblers, and the specialized teen treatment programs are rare. We're going to talk about a couple of them in a little bit, but um, servicers are generally in mental health or substance abuse disorder treatment centers, and so um, you know they're incorporated into the program and. I, sometimes they're, they're adult programming that's modified for adolescents, which you know, you have to be very careful of because when you're working with adolescents, you want it to be very individualized and you want it to be developmentally appropriate. So just, you know, dumbing down an adult program doesn't necessarily work. Um, then the cognitive behavioral um, CBT can be successful for highly motivated gamblers. And though adolescents might not want to change their behaviors, you can still do a lot of work around talking to them about their faulty thinking and their, um, what kind of risks they're taking and you know, what motivational interviewing is always incredibly useful with adults and adolescents. So um, that's a place to start. The other thing about CBT is that there's no harmful side effects. It's not like you know, we're going to talk about medication a little bit, and um, you know, it can't hurt to do CBT. You know, it, can, it might help, and it can't hurt. And then the next one, um, I, 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 this is not something I would share with, with clients. Um, Gamblers Anonymous is shown to have a low retention rate and a pretty low abstinence rate. But with, like with any kind of addiction, you also have the issue of um, people coming back. Like it takes on average of 12 times of attempting to quit in order for somebody with a substance use disorder to actually rack up any length of abstinence. And so the same thing happens with gambling. And so, you know, I don't want this, to, you know, that particular st statistic to dissuade anybody. Also, I think it's really hard to get data out of 12-step programs because they are anonymous. And so I, I, I take all of this with a grain of salt. I mean, this is, you know, what some of the research that I read said, but, I, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. So, um, you know, there's no empirical, you know, data to support um, GA's effectiveness for adolescents, but, um, but it's available, it's a structure, there's fellowship, there's support, um, you know, there's a, a bigger movement afoot these days, I think, for adolescents and young adults to be creating um, their own 12-step meetings. And a lot of these kids have 
concurrent, you know, drug and alcohol problems. So getting them involved in any kind of a 12-step program, I think, is, can be extremely valuable, where there's other kids their age and they have peers that they can rely on. And then um, there's me some medications. Um, if the child has a psychiatric comorbidity, you don't want to just start out with medication because there's really no medication that's geared towards gambling behavior. But if they have ADHD or anxiety or something like that, you might want to try, you know, obviously with the, uh, you know, the, a, a psychiatrist is going to have to help you out here. None of us can, you know, prescribe. But you may want to, <coughs> excuse me, you may want to look at some um, medications. So, um, but, you know, you, you want to use, you know, talk therapy first. Is a, is a selling job, if you're a counselor and it's the first time they're in your office, you are giving them your best pitch. And I believe your best pitch should include truth around what they're going to hear when they go to a meeting, when they go. If you can get them to go, you're going to try and send them to four, five, six meetings so that they can try different ones and get a different feel for it. The truth is some people in GA are going to say, your chances of successfully beating this are, you know, 2%. You, you'll hear all these different things from GA members who have been saying this for years and years because I hear it come back through my office all the time. And then when they come back to me and tell me that and they're all sad and worried, am I going to be the 1% that's going to make it the first time, I say, um, well, how do you define success? And I help them define success as you walked in the door and you asked for help. You showed up at a GA meeting. You know where to go should you need more help. You are way ahead of the game already, and that is success for me when they come back after a relapse and say, I just had to call you because I felt safe coming in here. I raise my hands in the victory salute and say, yay, you knew what to do. That is success. So defining success as complete abstinence, the way some research does that Denise alluded to in 12-step in anonymous type research, is not always the best parameter of success in my world. And then along the lines of medication, um, I keep hearing more and more, and Denise is somewhat of an expert in this area, learning disabilities and ADHD and ADD folks, Asperger's folks, you know, any, any children and young adults who have those kind of disorders, behavioral therapy is a huge part of their treatment, which means mom and dad and the counselor and the pastor all have to learn behavioral therapies to assist this person in being successful in life. That is not medicine. <laughs> that is involvement and activity, and we're going to try this and we're going to do that. So the reason CBT is such a huge success for most people, along with all the adjunct therapies, all the alternative therapies, the natural therapies, et cetera, you can't just do one and have just the one thing work. You need a lot of hands-on behavioral success in my world to see a person recover. And if you do resort to medications, um, there's no FDA-approved medications for pathological gambling. And, um, but there have been some controlled studies with adults that suggest that, that certain medications might reduce, reduce urges and cravings um, or re decrease gambling behaviors, and those include like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and opioid antagonists such as naltrexone, those kinds of things, or, you know, some mood stabilizers. But, you, you know, obviously you're going to be working with a psychiatrist, so you're going to be very careful about these. And it said, you know, the last thing it says is adult dosages don't need to be adjusted for adolescents with pathological gambling and comorbid psychiatric disorders. And um, you have to be very careful there, too, because some psychotropic meds can potentially increase problem gambling behaviors. So we have to be, you know, monitor our clients very closely for cha any changes in their behavior. So we want to be very careful if they're on meds that we're paying, uh, you know, a lot of attention to what's going on. And if you don't already have this as part of your practice, if you're new in the field or if you haven't worked in a hospital before, getting the consent to speak to the doctor the nurse, the teacher, the therapist, the social worker, the case manager, you know, there are so many people involved in children's lives in addition to their parents. I would hope that you are getting all of those consents for release of information so that you, because there's not a lot of case managers running around anymore that do this for you, you will probably become the 
quote unquote case manager and try to get a collaboration of communication between the doctor, the nurse, the therapist, the teacher, um, so that you can find out who adjusted the meds and why, what did the nutritionist say they should be eating. Um, my personal favorite thing lately is essential oils and nutrition because my clients need to have something that they can take home with them and do themselves to improve their own health because they either can't afford to or don't want to go to the doctor with everything that they have. So I would happily share that with my client's cardiologist when we were talking about his heart condition the other day. And he just kind of held his hand up and said, well, you can try, but I don't know how open he's going to be to hearing that. Okay, well, he and I are going to have a treatment plan about what, we, what I'm recommending, and we're going to send it to the cardiologist so that he knows what I'm doing, so that we're having communication. Because as you well know, on a good, tight treatment team, we should all be talking to each other. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to a client yesterday, and she was saying, that it was a brand new client, and she was saying that her cardiologist and her primary care physician talk to each other. I almost fell off my chair because that so seldom happens. I, you know, she's got really bad heart problems, so I was just delighted to hear that, you know, her physicians are actually speaking to each other, so I thought that was wonderful. That's, so, one, that's one pro-social activity that we can take to help our patients. Yeah, no kidding, no <laughs> kidding. So um, anyway, um, a lot of parents are aware of the destructive potential of substance abuse, but not of gambling, so they don't think about it in the same sense. And so once they're child gets into trouble, they may feel a sense of shame that they didn't recognize their teen's gambling problem or quote unquote control their child's behavior. And once again, you know, when you have a child that's involved in substances, it's oftentimes so much easier to identify that than a child who is involved in gambling because, you know, oftentimes folks who are involved um, with, in gambling activities are still paying attention to personal cleanliness, brushing their teeth, taking showers, those kinds of things, where kids that have drug and alcohol problems oftentimes will let some of those things slide. And, um, you know, kids that are gambling don't smell like a deck of cards. <laughs> like, you know, you, kids that are using drugs come home smelling like pot, you know, those kinds of things. Their eyes are dilated. It's just, it's, it's harder with kids that have gambling issues. Process addictions are just much more difficult to identify. Um, kids also feel a lot of remorse for having bet with their parents' money, lied to their parents, stolen money from their homes, from their purses, those kinds of things. And oftentimes that's where the suicide piece comes in. So we have to be very, very careful of our, um, you know, where our kids' moods are. And um, we need to address guilt and shame by acknowledging that pathological gambling is a psychiatric disease. Point to the DSM-5. I mean, show them where it says in writing. I do that with my clients all the time that have co-occurring mental health disorders. It's like, you know, here are some of the things that, you know, it, and oftentimes, you know, we talk about how we don't want to label people and um, we don't want it to follow them for the rest of their lives and that kind of thing. And, and I can understand that. However, with, oftentimes with my clients, they, it's such a huge relief that they can identify what the hell's wrong. And so it's like, oh, my gosh, there's something I can, now that I can name it, I can do something about it. So mm -hmm. that's oft, oftentimes incredibly helpful. You know, the other piece in all of this, too, is um, the rate of alcohol and drug abuse is actually seven times higher in persons with gambling disorders. of people with gambling disorders have a co-occurring mood disorder and about 60% have anxiety disorders. So there's a lot of crossover here that we need to pay attention to. So, and then lastly, you know, educate families about relapse signs and, um, and make sure that they get their own help. I mm -hmm. think Denise has addressed that, you know, with the Gaminon and those kinds of things. But, Family members need to have a venue where they can get their own support and education and begin the healing process. Yes, you're right. I focus on families probably more than gamblers certain days. I ask the family members what help they need for the betrayal, for the trauma, for the lies. For the, I just go down the list of things that I know they have been experiencing, whether they've talked about it yet or not. And that's usually when you, I see this kind of visible, physical lowering of the shoulders, relief, like thank you for acknowledging that. 
because people get called shameful, crazy names choosing to live with a gambler because they believe that the person should just leave them because they have a problem. And when the spouse chooses to stay, they need a lot of support and a lot of therapy. Well, it's really interesting because it's like with a family that has somebody in it that's abusing drugs or alcohol, it's oftentimes so obvious that the person is doing drugs or alcohol, and oftentimes the family inadvertently is enabling the behavior by calling in sick for them or cleaning up after them or hiding bottles or doing whatever it is. Oftentimes with the gambler, the family didn't know. It's like they're totally blindsided. All of a sudden, there's nothing left in the bank account. Yep. Everything is wiped out. Or their spouse is arrested for embezzling at work. So there's that huge piece of shock and anger. And it's a very different dynamic in the family relationships between the substance addictions and the process addictions. Oftentimes, there, it's just, there really was no knowledge. Yep. And it's not because they were dumb. And no, and not they, at all. They feel that way. So talking about it in a therapeutic setting is very important. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I just wanted to go over um, talking about what a, a profile of a young addict looks like when it, it when children present at, at Quest. And what I did was I went through our data and I sort of averaged the ages out. And the average age is 16. Um, most often our clients are male, Caucasian, but also maybe of Hispanic descent. We have a lot of kids that um, are Hispanic. And it's interesting because we have our, we've got both of our front office people are bilingual, bicultural. And I have a full-time staff member who is um, bilingual. And I have a contracted MFT who is bilingual, bicultural. And um, the kids normally speak both, both languages, or, um, or predominantly English, actually. But the parents don't. And we're very, very heavy on family counseling at Quest. Because the more you work with the family, the higher the likelihood of success with the child. So um, we do a lot of family work. A lot of the kids started using alcohol or marijuana at 12 or 13, and that's the um, transition from elementary school to middle school, which is just a killer for some kids. And um, some of our kids, though, start much younger, 9, 10. Um, it's actually getting younger. The longer I'm in the field, the younger it, it, it's getting, and the more availability there is. So um, our kids often have moved on from um, alcohol and marijuana to other drugs like ecstasy, mushrooms, meth, opiates as they age and they're exposed to it. They get into counseling as a result of the juvenile justice system or you know, some other adult authority saying you have an issue. So kids come into us not believing that they have a problem but um, there are, there's somebody in their lives that is pointing at them saying, you know, you've got an issue with this. So that's something that, that we constantly have to work with. They, they don't have um, a long-standing ingrained level of denial that some of our adults do, but they also think that they're still having quote unquote fun. Um, our kids, as far as I can tell, usually aren't gamblers, but I'm going to start looking at that a little bit differently. But they're very often into video games, texting, lots of stuff on the internet. They're much more um, technology savvy than you know, the, the older population. Oftentimes, our kids have difficulty in school. They're behind in credits. They may, may not be on track to graduate. So we do a lot of work around GED prep, um, tutoring, trying to get them to a position where they are going to be able to progress in, in, in school. Oftentimes, you know, 50 to 70 percent, as I look at my stats, our kids have co-occurring mental health conditions that are, include but aren't limited to oppositional defiance disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, anxiety, those kinds of things. So a lot of our kids have um, dual diagnosis. And specifically, I, I was looking at a specific case and of course, the name, age, lots of things have been changed in this case because I don't want him to be able to be identifiable. But um, this child is, is now 20. And actually, he's been playing video games since um, he was five or six. 
he states, he told me his parents had limited his time, actually not on the computer, he, was a lot, he was, um, had video games when he was young, and he only recalls being able to play games on the weekend, so he was restricted a lot. When he entered his teens, his parents allowed him to participate in online games. Now he plays an average of eight hours a day. Um, he created an electronic sports team, and he wants to compete and win money, and I believe they play Battlefield, and it's a team, and they play other teams, and then I guess there's competitions all over the country or all over the world, and you can actually win money. And he's never, what cracked me up was when he was talking about them, I thought these were like four or five of his best friends kind of thing. He's never met any of them face to face. And when he said that he's met them on Skype, he said it like that was face to face. Wow. And I said, wow, that is so different for me, you know, so I was trying to explain to him how that alien that is to me because I wasn't raised that way. We, it's, you know, like my parents weren't raised with television, so that was alien to them, you know. So it was a very interesting conversation. What was really fascinating was that he was diagnosed with high-functioning Asperger's and ADHD when he was in elementary school. So when we were talking about that, he said that he finds it much easier to interact on technology than he does in person. And so that's something that he's been working on. And um, he's been in therapy on and off most of his life. And he's currently seeing a counselor at Quest, obviously, that's how I met him. And, but he said that he goes mostly to appease his mother. He doesn't think that there's anything wrong. Mm. And um, it was fascinating when I was talking to him about his whole social interaction piece because he told me that he doesn't like to um, go clubbing, and he doesn't do those kinds of things, but he sometimes binge drinks and smokes marijuana when he's doing his gaming, but he doesn't ha like have an off switch. He reaches a point of saturation where he absolutely can't do it anymore, and then he'll stop. And this is alone in his basement kind of thing. And then um, he won't do it again for several weeks. It's just, you know, he kind of reminds me of some of these guys that you read about that have done sort of horrible things. But he sounds, when you're talking to him, you know, pretty normal. Before we switch, um, sure. something that you mentioned that I wanted to bring out for discussion is when we're therapists and we're meeting this one individual, we, we need to have collaborative information. Because you told me that you had a, a quick question with his other therapist and found out, you know, what is the reality of him actually truly winning money? Is he to that level? Can he compete like that? Because sometimes kids are, and you want to kind of get a reality check, and what did you find out? That he's probably not good enough, and that, you know, his I, it's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's actually a fantasy about him being able to win $10,000 playing this particular game with his electronic sports team, and um, which was sad to, to find out, but, you know, he has it in his brain that this is a possibility for him. So, And as far as dealing with gamblers or people who take risks like this, if we don't have data and if we don't have collaborative information to bring into reality their irrational thinking, like you talked about before, the illusion control and the irrational thinking, right. we're not doing them any favors. We exactly. Need, we need to treat them with reality. Yeah, unfortunately, he says that spending eight hours a day playing games is um, like being a, an athlete, that he has to practice so he, in order to be able to get to a position to win this huge amount of money. But anyway, when we did start talking about his real life, quote unquote, he did have a job. He actually worked in a fast food restaurant for four years, but he was recently fired for what he said was a series of small infractions of the rules. But he also told me he didn't really like his job, and so we talked about self-sabotaging, and you know, I, I think that there's some of that played in here. He's now job hunting, and I think he had an interview this week, and he's taking a couple of classes at TMCC and actually doing well. And he said his goal is to be a police officer, which I found fascinating. Um, he's, you know, like I said, he's been in counseling for a year, and his mom, and sometimes his stepfather frequently attend family sessions. His biological dad is actually in prison. His stepdad adopted him when he was very young. However, according to his therapist, there's been very little movement on anybody's part in this process. So the counselor asked Matt, you know, what does he want to do? I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste your parents' money. What, what do you want to do? And he actually came up with the idea of coming in once a month and then having three specific goals per session and then completing those before he comes back. So one of the things I wanted to ask um, the folks that are listening is what other dy dynamics do you think could be at work in this scenario? And what other things do 
we need to look at and question and maybe bring up. And um, if, if you guys want to just throw out a few things here, that would be great. And this is a perfect time for our final polling question because it actually parallels that. OK. So we'll, we'll throw up the final polling question and um, start wrapping up here. So it is, how would you help teens and parents learn to have pro-social kinds of fun and recovery, not just telling them to get a hobby? How would you actually sell them on it, convince them, and teach them? And when you think of Matt's case, you know, what other things do you want to know about, and how would you be you know, pulling Matt and his family into a more successful treatment um, plan or strategy? What would you need to know, and what kind of things would you suggest? So you can throw your answers onto this polling question now. Um, and we'll give you a minute to answer that while we move on to the next slide. Um, the next slide is going to be talking about a Reno Problem Gambling Center case. So I want to give you guys a minute to answer. How do you help teens and parents learn to have pro-social kinds of fun and recovery? I'm going to give you a big clue. One of the things that Denise talked about that I'm at Reno Problem Gambling Center because I hadn't done it in a long time. We're going to have a Halloween party, and I'm going to incorporate activities regularly and consistently into our therapy groups where they have a safe place to practice. And I hope you guys are still awake out there because we're not seeing any answers on our last polling question. So go ahead and throw one out there. There's one. Um, give them a list of activities. Um, tell them that too much available time can be a trigger. Um, through discussion of addiction as a disease, explain and explore the deficits that they have had that they are trying to fill. That's a good one. You know, like Denise was talking about with the um, definition of the disease concept of addiction coming out of DSM and other clinical research that you can point to people, giving them a reality check on what you have is an illness. Here, let me show you the research. And then finding out, so what was it that you were trying to fill that big black hole with? And I, I believe nature abhors a vacuum. So you're mm -hmm. saying, you know, take out um, the gambling, take out the drugs, take out the alcohol. What are you going to fill it with? Yep. You know, so. Yeah, physics. There you go. So we only got two results. I hope there are still some other people left in the room. God bless you for staying for the entire two hours and not, <laughs> not getting up and leaving. I appreciate that. Um, this next slide is the compilation of what addicted families look like at the Reno Problem Gambling Center. What I keep hearing Denise say that I think is important for you to note and why you need to ask financial questions is how much are people in debt? And please start with that question because we're not going to assume that anybody's debt is gambling related, but it's important that you know how much financial stress your families are under. So a question came up on the chat room earlier. Should we be asking why teens are spending a ridiculous amount of time working for money? Well, yeah. Are they trying to support their five members of the family at home who are, for whatever reason, not able to work? That's one reason why they may you know, be busily working. Or, in my case, once uh, families find out that they no longer have the college fund, the safety net, their vacation fund, not only that, but so-and-so is about to lose their job because of all the absences. And so then people start working two jobs. Can you imagine the financial stress, like Denise said, of discovering that your nest egg, your savings account, and many of your valuable belongings are gone and cannot be retrieved? That's where financial stress is the key component that I hear people walking in the door with. That's their number one complaint. I don't know what we're going to do financially. And then their number two complaint is, I have been lied to, betrayed, and traumatized, and I don't think I can trust this person anymore, and I'm, I'm going to leave him or her unless you can do something to convince me to stay. So if, if you look at this profile and you see that because it is a hidden addiction and there are taboos wrapped around gambling addiction, we've talked many different ways today about how you need to address those taboos and how you as a counselor, helper, family, friend, neighbor can Sit with the shame, listen to the person talking about it, that you're going to give them a great gift just by listening. You don't have to be an expert. Just listen and let them spill and then start making suggestions about what kind of treatment, whether it's trauma treatment, marital treatment, financial treatment. You can actually get a degree 
we call it a degree, it's a certificate in financial and social work online from the only gal in the country who does this. And you can learn more about how to help people financially. So we are going to move on to what some of the treatment resources and services are that we're available in this area and beyond. Um, what was really interesting is McGill University, um, there's a lot of fascinating information online from out of McGill University in Canada. And so I, I would strongly encourage people to look at their website. Um, Paradigm Malibu Adolescent Treatment Center um, does specialization in um, treatment for adolescent gamblers, but I would bet my bottom dollar it's incredibly, incredibly expensive, especially mm -hmm. where it is. And then I found this great um, clinic associated with Columbia University in New York, and they work with adolescents with gambling disorders, and it's free. So if somebody's on the East Coast or has relatives they can stay with on the East Coast, that, that might be an option for them. Then, of course, there's Reno Problem Gambling Center and um, Quest Counseling. Willow Springs Hospital also does um, addresses gambling um, addiction in their adolescent program with their other addiction issues. Um, Bristlecone Family Resources only works with adults, so I just want to throw that out there. And then you also have the resource of the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling and, of course, GA. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys had a few resources um, and services that you could look at. Um, the reason I highlight the Nevada Council, and those of you that are listening and participating in this webinar from other states like Nebraska and Iowa, every, uh, not every state has a council on problem gambling, but I know Nebraska and Iowa do. 34 of the 50 states do. Our Nevada Council would be happy to send you the information out of state if you want their information. One of the things we have in Nevada are two free DVD and discussion packets that you could I basically call it a class in a box. You could get given the chance or the damage done video with the instructions on how to show the video and get a discussion going, a pre and post questionnaire. It's a wonderful resource that you can get for free from the Nevada Council along with tons of other pamphlets, booklets, and useful resources. And I just wanted to mention a couple other things that um, I have you know, found enormously helpful. You, there's a, your favorite movie um, about gambling is called Owning Mahoney. Yes. And that came out in 2003 with Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I haven't seen it, but what I've read about it, it sounds like he does an incredible portrayal. He does. Just make sure that you don't watch it alone. It's very depressing. <laughs> so it's one of those, if you're going to tell your clients to watch it, you want them to have support before, during, and after. And then a couple other movies that I actually want to watch again with all the information I now have, I want, I want to look at again so I can get a different perspective. Um, the Hustler with Paul Newman, um, The Gambler with James Caan, those were really good movies. 21 with Kevin Spacey. And then um, there's a Hazelden documentary that you were talking about. I love this one Hazelden documentary called It's Not About the Money, and it'll cost you hundred bucks to get it from Hazelden. I promise you it's worth your investment. When my clients and families watch this and we go through it piece by piece, they really relate to the individuals. And when I show it to my college students, they specifically will report that the college student in the video surprised them. They had no idea that college students on campuses are gambling and losing money and becoming suicidal. So very useful documentary. And then um, Gabe, which was a, an A&E intervention program in season one. And then Pleasure Unwoven by Kevin McCauley, which is more about drugs and alcohol, but it talks about the addiction process on the brain. And we use it. It's about an hour. And Dr. McCauley now on his website has additional resources that you can use in treatment to uh, follow up on that. And I just have to say that his, his explanation of gambling and addiction on the brain is the best one I've seen yet in video format that um, people can sit down in front of the video and really appreciate. So before we go, because we've got about 30 seconds, if anyone has a uh, burning desire or question, if you could throw it into the chat room right now, we just want to thank you for your participation. I enjoyed watching the chat as it was going along. And um, you can reach us by email or by our phone numbers. There's a lot of ways to get the information that we gave you today, not the least of which is on the CASAT website. Thank you again, CASAT. 
And is there anything that you guys need right now? Let's let's hear it. Um, and we're going to pause while we're waiting to see if anybody has any burning questions. And um, any housekeeping, Sherry, that we need to uh, do before we close? Uh, just that uh, when we close the webinar, you're going to have a link to the uh, short survey come up on your screen. If you would be so kind as to complete that survey, we would really appreciate it. Yeah. And then your CEU certificate is going to be found online tomorrow? It's already up there. Nice. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you. Goodbye, and I'm not going to wish you good luck because I don't wish good luck anymore. I wish you success. If you're still a student, I wish you great memory retrieval. If you're heading into the holidays, I wish you excellent shopping experiences that stay within your budget. And be healthy and be well. Bye, you guys. <laughs> Thank you.